Welcome to the Copeland Coaching Podcast, where it's all about turning your job search into a slam dunk. Your host is Angela Copeland. Welcome to the Copeland Coaching Podcast. I'm your host, Angela Copeland. On the phone with me today, I have Thea Kelly in San Francisco, California. Thea is an interview coach and author of the book, Get the Job, The Quick and Complete Guide to a Winning Interview. Thea, thanks for joining me today. Thank you, Angela. Really excited to be talking with you. Yes, well, I'm so excited. I would really like to start off talking a little bit about California because you you live in the place that I think we all want to move. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and you know, when it comes to job interviews, one of the very first questions that we typically get asked by the human resources person, they call us to kind of screen us and we have a real casual conversation and they, you know, ask us, uh, why are you interested in this job and what is your availability for an interview? And then all of a sudden, very often they ask us, how much do you make? And it can really throw us off. But I understand that in certain places, like in California, that question is actually becoming illegal. And so I'm curious from what you're seeing in California, how is that question kind of evolving in the, in the interview? Yes. Well, it is illegal and therefore they're not asking it as much, but it still does happen occasionally. And the last thing you want to do is call them out about it and say, well, actually that question's illegal. You know, that's really going to right away. You're starting the relationship with criticism. So Um, there's a couple of different ways you could handle that if they do ask it anyway. Um, For one thing, you could just gently sidestep it. You might say something like, well, I think what's most important is my potential value to your company. And we're still in the process of establishing that. But I do understand that you want to make sure the compensation is going to be a fit both ways. So may I ask you this? What range do you have budgeted? Ooh, I like that. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. I find that very often, especially if it's the HR person, they will answer that question. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yes. And and as you uh, might be guessing, or uh, since you've researched things about salary in California, they are now required to tell you uh, what their range is for the position. So again, hopefully they will do that. And when they do, Um, You don't want to absolutely commit to being willing to accept something in that range because over the course of the interview process, you might discover that you really could have gotten a little bit more at one end of it, the high end. (laughs) Um, So what you want to say is something vague like, well, that sounds like a reasonable ballpark. And I'm sure once we decide this is a good fit, we'll be able to agree on the compensation package. Mm -hmm. I think that's the other thing that's hard, right, is a lot of times they're looking for a base salary number, but you don't know yet what, if there's a bonus, what the bonus looks like, what the vacation is. It's really hard when, um, I think when a company is trying to pin you down on a particular number, uh, because it's, it's, it's just tough. I'm curious from, so I, I love this new law and that's why I wanted to start with this question. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, from your perspective, and when people talk about it in California, why, so a lot of people say to me, Angela, why does it matter if they ask how much how much I make. <laughs> and recruiters in particular will say, well, I'm just trying to understand if you're in my budget. Um, why is this question illegal? Why, why has California made this illegal? Yes, well, it's very understandable. Uh, but it, them asking that question can lead to inequities and it can really perpetuate some of the, some of the classic inequities that are going on. For instance, if somebody has been paid less throughout their career because they're a woman or because they belong to some other group that's historically underpaid, then the employer now knows how little they've been making and can simply continue that inequity. So mm-hmm. I think that's really the main thinking behind um, ending that practice. Mm-hmm. I, I totally agree. And the other thing too, like say you come from a small business and you're interviewing at a big corporation, sometimes for the exact same job, different companies pay very different amounts. And right. so, you know, from my experience, I want to be paid fairly based on what that company pays, not absolutely my old situation. Um, so I understand that when you ask for the pay range, uh, the one requirement I saw was that you have to have had at least one interview. Like, I think you can't just like email them with, with, you know, out of the blue and say, I'd like to know your pay range. But, you know, when, 
when you like, I think this is kind of a tricky question, right? Like how, how do you, well, you mentioned asking, I guess that's, that is how you ask, right? You, when you kind of push back and you're asking, what do you have budgeted? That's, that's your way of asking the pay range. You're right. Just in a very matter of fact, pleasant tone. Uh, it's a, it's a sensible piece of information, reasonable piece of information for you to be asking for. So yeah. I recently saw, and I'm I'm curious what you might think about this. I recently saw someone interviewing for a job in California. It's actually in San Diego. But the company in San Diego, first of all, they're based in Nashville, but the job is in San Diego. And um, they, they have like an office there. And they have a headhunter, basically like an external recruiter who's out of another place. Like I think the headhunter's in Chicago. And I really got the sense, um, based on what I've learned, that I don't think that headhunter in Chicago was familiar with this California law about the pay range. And I just wonder, I mean, that kind of situation seems so tricky when you need to get the, the information out of the person, but maybe they are sort of operating in a different um, situation in their state. I don't know. Have you seen that before where the, the recruiter is actually not based in California? Um, I can't think of an example exactly, but I can absolutely see how that would happen. Right. And, um, and you might, uh, I'm just uh, thinking off the top of my head, you might sort of want to gently ask them, uh, uh, is there uh, a way that you could find that information about the pay range? Right. Um, and just, you know, g- gently probe on that. But if you, if ultimately they're not going to give you the range, um, then your next recourse is to say, well, I've been researching online uh, what positions like this typically pay in this area. And I'm seeing anything from blank to blank. But you notice I'm just saying I'm seeing from blank to blank. You're not saying I'd accept something between blank and blank, right? So say I'm seeing everything, anything from blank to blank. And I'm sure that once we decide there's a good fit here that we'll be able to agree on a compensation package that's fair. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And again, so I'm I'm, again using that language. I'm sure that once we decide it's a fit, we'll be able to agree. It's just intended to reassure them that, hey, you are a reasonable person and we should definitely move forward. And a lot of times that will be all that you need to do. I think you're absolutely right. And, you know, I think it is important to note, too, that if you ever do yourself present a range that you might be comfortable with, you want to be sure you're comfortable with the low end as well as the high end. Because sometimes we give a low end that's sort of below what we really want, hoping they'll kind of pick in the middle. Right. Right. That's a good thing to keep in mind. And how you research and how you choose that range is kind of important. They might ask you to back it up. They might ask, where did you see that? So you don't want to be making it up. But, um, you know, if you find something ridiculous on one site, you can just never mention that you went to that site. Mm -hmm. Uh, Now, I I just wanted to mention that uh, this whole matter of what do you say if they ask, uh, if they say, no, they don't know what the range is and so on. I have a little infographic I developed. Mm -hmm. that tells you exactly what to say if they say X and what to say if they say Y. Um, And I would be happy to make that available for free to anybody who emails me and just mentions this podcast. And I know that, Angela, at the end of the uh, podcast, you're going to be giving some contact information. So people can then get in touch with me and I'll send you the infographic. And I think think it helps to actually see it kind of mapped out visually. Oh, that sounds great. You know, I think I appreciate that. Thank you. I think... Mm -hmm negotiating for pay is one of the hardest things. I mean, in, in terms of emotionally, it's really hard. It, it, can, yeah. it can feel hard, I should say. And, you know, it actually happens much sooner in the process. Like often we're thinking, oh, this is the last thing we're going to do in the process. And it turns out we're having a negotiation before we even have an interview. Well, that's what you must not allow to happen, you see. Right. Because when they ask you things like, how much did you make or how much are you looking for? Um, you don't want that to turn into a negotiation. That's why I'm counseling these really open-ended kind of answers, very Mm non-committal, because the only time you really have a strong negotiating position is when they've made you a definite offer, preferably Mm -hmm. in writing. Right, exactly, preferably in writing. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and I think some of the things that uh, I've seen that 
you write about and speak about are about how important negotiation is. And often when I talk to job seekers, they'll say, gosh, well, it really scares me. I'd rather not. Mm -hmm. And I often say to them, listen, it's it's five minutes to be uncomfortable. And if, <laughs> if, if I told you that in, if you were slightly uncomfortable for five minutes, you could make $10,000 a year extra, you know, would you do it? And mm-hmm. they say, of course. Absolutely. So I think that's what you got to think of. Yeah. And it's not only the next salary that's impacted, but because the salary after that is going to probably be based on the salary you made in this next job, it really can influence the whole rest of your career. And it does get easier over time negotiating. Once mm-hmm. you've broken the ice and done it once, you're going to be much more comfortable doing it from then on. And I have a nice little tool about negotiation too, a little negotiation template that's like a, a worksheet that you work with and fill out ahead of time to prepare yourself for the meeting, guides oh. you through the whole thing. And that's a, that is something you can actually get uh, from me also. And at the end of the podcast, I'll tell how you can get that. Oh, that's excellent. That's excellent. I know these kinds of tools are so, so helpful. Mm -hmm. Also on another topic, you know, say we get the job interview, like the, the phone screen goes well, maybe we have a phone interview and eventually we end up in an in-person interview. And there's a topic I've seen that you, you talk about, which is body language. And it's the one thing where we are communicating something to the hiring manager without saying a word. And sometimes it comes out the body language comes out before we even start talking. So from your perspective, I'm curious, what should we know when it comes to our body language in a job interview? Uh, Basically, what you're trying to convey is that you're confident, that you're open, you're not hiding anything, and um, that you're interested and motivated, um, and that you like the person you're talking to. And so all the little tips you might see about specifics of body language, like lean forward a little bit, it's intended to convey those things. It it conveys that you're really interested and that you're listening. Um, So some of the other major things are um, how you smile and shake hands at the beginning of the interview. So it's always a good idea to have a friend test your handshake or a few friends, you know, and say, what did you think of my handshake? And make sure that it's firm enough, but not too firm. Uh, and so on, and uh, making sure that you smile when you're introduced to people is super important. And throughout the interview, to smile occasionally, not too much to the point where you don't seem real, but (laughs) not being real straight-faced for minutes and minutes and minutes on end without ever cracking a smile. Um, Another thing I'm frequently asked about, is it okay to talk with my hands? Yes, in moderation. If you're a person who tends to talk with their hands really a lot, you might just tone it down a little bit. Um, Also, your hand gestures should be kind of smooth and not real rapid, like not moving your hands into a gesture and then immediately dropping it. You know, convey confidence by holding the gesture for a moment. Um, It's also well known in research that uh, showing your palms tends to indicate openness and Uh, liking somebody and being comfortable with somebody and being honest. Uh, You can't just sit there showing your palms to them all the time, but try to keep that in mind and don't always be hiding your hands or putting or keeping your hands face down on the desk for long periods of time in your gestures. Try and open your hands to them a little bit. Um, So if our hands are on the table, are you thinking mm -hmm. maybe we turn the hands up at some points where the palms are showing? You went straight to the trickiest part of it because it's it's not really natural to sit with your hands palm up at a table. Mm-hmm. If you try it right now, those of you who are at a table, don't try it if you're driving. Um, you'll see that. So what you can do instead is practice resting your hands on a table in front of you in such a way that uh, your hands look relaxed. And while your palms may not be directly pointing at the interviewer, they're kind of up, or at least one of them is up and the other one's down. Um, also, you can put your hands on the table in a sort of steepling uh, pose where um, your fingertips are all touching the fingertips of the opposite hand. You don't want to overdo that, but it tends to be a gesture that makes you look um, insightful, like you're really thinking. And, <laughs> and you can either do that steepling um, 
in front of your body or or you can rest that steepling down on the table. So that's another good gesture. But I want to get to um, beyond just the externals of body language. The reason these different kinds of body language give the impression that they do is that they are the kinds of body language we naturally and unconsciously use when we are feeling confident and open to someone. So I think a really good thing to do is practice actually being confident and open and having a friendly attitude toward the other person um, so that your body language will naturally show that. Now, how do you do that? Obviously, ahead of time, right? You can't just practice it right there in the interview. A really good way to practice that is either by role playing, by maybe looking uh, looking in a mirror, or maybe set up your computer to um, on some sort of camera setting where it shows you yourself, um, and then actually talk at it and see what the different gestures look like. Um, oh, but that's actually more practicing the externals. Let me get back to the internal thing. A really good technique for getting ready for any kind of athletic performance or artistic performance or career performance is to vividly imagine feeling the way you want to feel. So what I always tell people is take some time to sit down, close your eyes, and vividly imagine doing the interview in a really confident state of mind, feeling open and interested toward the other person, feeling like that person is a future colleague who you're already liking and they're already liking you and it's going to be a good relationship. Um, and I actually, when I work with my clients, I make them a recording in which I talk them through that process so that they can do that mental practice with their imagination without being distracted, without getting off track. Um, so uh, this kind of mental practice uh, has been used successfully by a lot of famous athletes and musicians like Vladimir Horowitz, the famous pianist, and uh, Tiger Woods uh, practicing his golf swing. So it's, uh, it's not a woo-woo, new-agey thing. It's, it's a real practical thing. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. You know, I once had a, uh, a speaking coach share with me, you know, react to the person as if they are reacting to you the way that you want them to. And mm -hmm. what I mean is sometimes you go into an interview, you know, especially during the, the on-site day and the hiring manager, your boss might interview you. Well, they most likely will interview you, uh, maybe their boss. And there might be a couple of other people that are essentially doing them a favor, like peers of theirs, uh, other people within the business. And I have found that sometimes those folks come in and, and they'd like to maybe be somewhere else. <laughs> like you just can pick up on the fact that like they didn't get enough sleep or yeah. they've got other things to do. And you've got to try with your body language and the way that you come across to not sort of get sucked in if they are giving you uh, the signal that, that they don't want to be there. Like, um, now, if, if they seem distracted, maybe you work on sort of pulling them back in in some way. But uh, I think at the end of the day, you can't go down a neg negative path with them if, if they start to feel that way just because it may have nothing to do with you. Right. You have to just assume in advance and practice assuming that if you see anything like that in the body language, it's not about you. And uh, maybe even to practice feeling a little bit of compassion toward that person who has a lot on their plate or is tired or whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. Agreed. You know, the other thing along those lines is that very often the person who's interviewing you is also nervous. Mm -hmm. And we rarely ever think of that. But most people don't themselves conduct interviews all that often. Mm -hmm. So just as it's hard to be interviewed, it can be hard to conduct an interview. Um, you know, so I would keep that in mind too. Yeah, they're terrified really because if they hire the wrong person, uh, it could set them back twenty thousand, fifty thousand dollars in in training costs and salary and, and lost productivity. So uh, they're worried about the process, just like you are. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, so speaking of the in person, the other thing besides body language that is very important is what we wear to a job interview. And I do get a lot of questions about what should I wear? Should I just wear a suit or what what makes sense to wear? And you know, from your experience, Thea, what what do you recommend that we wear to our next job interview? 
Um, when you get into the fine points of it, there are disagreements because, it, it, you know, fashion is just, it's something very subjective and that's always changing. But uh, the common, the best rule of thumb is dress one level of formality up from the way you would dress to do the job on a day-to-day -day basis. And if you don't know how the people in that workplace dress, you can just simply ask the, the HR person who, or the recruiter who made the initial appointment with you, how do people in this role dress there? And so if, if you're told they, they dress business casual, uh, now business casual is not to be confused with casual. Business casual does not mean jeans. It means some kind of slacks that are not necessarily dress slacks, but they're not jeans, okay? And it means uh, a nice shirt, not a t-shirt with a band name on it, but uh, maybe a polo shirt or a button-down shirt or a, a nice sweater um, and maybe a blazer. That's what business casual means. So if you're going to be working in business casual, you want to go to the interview in a suit. On the other hand, uh, let's say you're uh, looking at a tech firm in Silicon Valley. Uh, they may be running around in shorts and flip-flops and t-shirts. So if you come in in a suit, you're not, they're not going to relate to you at all. So one step up from the t-shirts and flip-flops is what I mentioned, business casual. Uh, so nice slacks, closed toe shoes, a nice shirt, maybe or maybe not the blazer, maybe a nice sweater instead if it's a cool day. Yeah, so just a level up. Um, and if you are wearing a suit... There's uh, the recommended colors. The most often recommended colors are charcoal gray or other grays or dark blue. Mm. So there's a good start for you. Oh, that's very helpful. And I think you're right about dressing one step up. I've actually seen this work uh, or not work <laughs> in, in a couple of examples. I know for myself, you know, I went through engineering school in undergrad and they taught us wear a black suit, wear a black suit. And uh, I remember I actually went to a job interview in Santa Barbara and it was for a high-end women's clothing company and everyone, it was very natural fabrics. When I went in, people were wearing like Birkenstocks. It was very Santa Barbara <laughs> and I had a black suit on and I remember like I could have done the job perfectly, uh, but they looked at me like, you really don't belong here. And it, right. it, it really taught me that lesson. Very good point, because different industries have different cultures and different parts of the country, too. But, but it, that was in um, the fashion industry. So it's going to be a different vibe, even for people in the engineering department. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it's true. And in the sort of in the opposite way, I have a friend that I went to graduate school with who lives in Los Angeles and works in digital marketing. And he flew out, I don't know if it was to Boston or New York, somewhere on the East Coast. And he showed up for an interview in jeans and a blazer. Oh. <laughs> and they looked at him like he was from another planet because they uh -huh. expected him in a suit and he wasn't. Yeah. He also had no idea. So it's really interesting culturally. Um, right. You know, and, and unfortunately, job interviews are just, they're not a fair process. It's very subjective. And it's based on a lot of these things like body language and what you wear. At least those are a, a factor. And they're a factor that makes, you know, it's very important. Right. Uh, yeah. Well, so after we're in the interview, right, the first thing is the person looks at us. They look at our body language. They look at what we're wearing. And, and we sit down, start to talk. And typically one of the very first things that we are asked is basically to give our elevator pitch. And an elevator pitch is answering the question, tell me about yourself. So when we are asked this question, and usually it's at the very beginning, how do you recommend that we answer it? Um, so this is a very important first impression moment. In a way, the first impressions, impression may be when they first saw you. Oh, excuse me, I need a drink of water. <coughs> but this is the first time you've spoken for an extended period of time. So. I think the first thing you want to get right out there at the very beginning is what are the top few reasons why they should hire you instead of one of the other candidates. I think you want to memorably imprint upon their mind what I would call, what you could call your brand, your unique selling proposition, your key selling points. 
I, I tend to call it key selling points, or sometimes I call them REV points, because I have an acronym, REV, R-E-V, about how to know what top uh, qualities or skills or attributes of you are most likely to uh, make you stand out as the person for the job. So you want to identify maybe three to five things about you that are highly relevant. That's the R in Rev. So they've got to be what employers are really looking for, what they really want, that are exceptional. That's the E in Rev. So it's got to be something not everybody has. So it's not a basic qualification that all of the people they're interviewing are going to have. And then V for verifiable. Um, so it's it's got to be something that's not just your opinion, but that you, you can actually back up with um, some form of evidence, like a story, or um, or if, if one of your um, top rev points or selling points is simply that you have a lot of experience, that's something that's automatically verifiable right there. It's it's just a fact. Um, but if you're if one of your top selling points you believe is that you're a great communicator or that you really engage your team, just saying that that you haven't given them any verification, you haven't given them any proof. So you're going to need to tell a little story or example or some kind of um, accomplishment that kind of proves that. So I say definitely identify what your top selling points are and then give an approximately one minute or less answer that hits on all those points. And I have a little example here. Sure. So this is an example of a person who's uh, interviewing for a job as a human resources manager. So they might, so let's say that the key selling points or rev points they've identified about themselves is one that they have really broad experience in all the different areas of HR, employee relations, benefits, blah, blah, blah. And secondly, that they have a talent for strategic thinking. Then they also have some awards. And they also have inspired a really loyal and high-performing team. And they have an MBA. So that's five things that they'd kind of like to communicate. So they might say something like this. So tell me about yourself. Oh, I thank you. I'd like to. Um, I was excited to see that you're looking for someone with expertise in so many different areas within HR because that's exactly what my background is like. I've been very fortunate that my 14-year career at Niagara Incorporated and at Davis Direct has allowed me to gain experience in all of the areas you've mentioned. And I've been able to solve some complex strategic issues in all those areas as well. For example, and then a little two-sentence uh, success example, um, for which I actually was recognized with a top performer award. And I couldn't have achieved any of that without a really engaged team. So the team is super important. And um, I know that I've done that well because in the past five years, I've had four team members promoted up into higher positions in the organization. And I was kind of sorry to lose some of them, but at the same time, it was a great feeling seeing them um, reach their dreams. And um, I'm also very passionate about serving the business. And my MBA has helped me partner closely with executives in various departments. So can I expand on any of that for you? And that's how you end with a question inviting their feedback. Oh, that's excellent. I love that example. And I really like the fact that you mentioned using things that are verifiable. Because mm -hmm. you're right. You don't want to just say, I'm good at X, Y, Z. You need to show them. You need to explain it. And storytelling is such an important part of answering questions in a job interview. Right. And people will say, well, can I tell a story right then in the tell me about yourself answer? You can if you can make it short enough. So identify one of your stories and then identify what are the really key elements of this story, the problem that I, what problem was involved, what action did I take, what were the results, and see if you can say that in just two sentences. And there you've got a little micro story you can put into a tell me about yourself answer. Mm -hmm. I think the other thing that you really demonstrated in your example, a question I get a lot of times is, well, this stuff is already in my resume. Is it really okay to repeat it? I mean, I've already told them in the resume. And what you demonstrated with your example is, first of all, yes, you're, you're including things from your resume. But what the purpose of the elevator pitch is, in part, is to show that you're a good communicator. I think it's also to kind of remind the interviewer 
who you are. I mean, they may be interviewing multiple people, but it's, it's your chance also to give your personal narrative and to kind of wrap it together, like you said, in a way that is customized for this particular role. Right. And, and I didn't really reiterate my background as this HR manager. I, all I said about my resume basically was um, uh, I've had a 14-year career at Niagara Incorporated and Davis Direct. And then I talked about my accomplishments, but I didn't say, you know, for at 19, in 1997, I went to work for Davis Direct. So I, I didn't give a career post-mortem. But, you know, there's a lot of different approaches to the tell me about yourself answer. And another approach that I think is also good is uh, to really emphasize what motivates you. So to just start out with something like, you know, what really drives me is and, and go from there. And one way or another, you do want to express something of your enthusiasm and of who you are in this answer. And so uh, in, this, in the example I gave, it was involved in saying how really important this person feels it is to have a super engaged team and that they're also passionate about serving the business, which not every HR person is. Some HR people are really more focused on the employees. Um, so, yeah, it's really important to, to give them a sense of who you are as an individual. Give them some insight. Let them feel that they know you and trust you and, and, and go from there. Sometimes people find it helpful to um, have some sort of memorable little slogan or moniker for themselves. Um, one of my colleagues, uh, a well-known career coach named Mark Miller, says that he used to introduce himself as a geek who can speak, <laughs> by which he meant, uh, I'm a technical guy who also has good communication skills. And I'm yeah. sure it was very memorable. I'm sure that afterwards they are saying, yeah, he was, this was the geek who can speak. Oh, him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's great. That's really helpful. Yeah. Well, the one thing I didn't hear in your elevator pitch that I get questions about sometimes is personal information. So sometimes people will say to me, well, shouldn't I include some personal information? Do they want to know that too? And I think the answer is no. <laughs> no, from yes. My perspective. It's irrelevant. Yes. Um, if it is directly relevant, sure. Like if it's very important for you to demonstrate that you have stability and that you know a geographic area really well, then you might mention that you were born there. Um, or if, uh, if you're going to work for um, an outdoors equipment company like REI or Patagonia, it might be just fine to say, and on a personal note, uh, I just got back from a fly fishing expedition in the Sierras. Sure, right. because it's relevant. But if it's, if it's just about definitely not, don't talk about how many kids you have. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that may be super important to you and <laughs> who you are. Of course it is. But it, it doesn't say anything about your ability to do the job well. And in fact, it might even make them worry about, oh, is this person going to be focused on their kids during the day instead of on the job? Right. Yeah. Well, you do make a good point with your example about REI. I worked with a client maybe five years ago now who was coming from higher education. He'd been in administration for years. And he ended up getting a job working for Hilton Hotels and their corporate office doing corporate strategy, which was totally different. And the thing that was in his background, and it was sort of, it was a personal detail really, was that on the side outside of work, he had been investing in real estate, which Hilton is kind of a real estate company. And he'd also been helping a, fran a friend to manage some franchise locations of a gym franchise. And Hilton is a, is a franchise. And so um, he did have to look for ways in that case to work in those sort of personal details, but they were relevant to the business. So it's very different than, like you said, sharing information about your family. Mm -hmm. Right. Very good point. Well, so another thing that I know you, you talk about is questions that seem impossible to answer. And I sometimes, you know, I'll speak with job seekers and they'll tell me they've been asked, like, if you were a sandwich, like what kind of sandwich would you be? Like really strange questions or, you know, tough math questions. Or I've even seen computer programmers who are asked to write code and sometimes even in a language that they don't no. Mm. And I'm curious, first of all, I guess the question is when you're talking about an impossible questions, are these the kind of questions you see? Or are there other impossible questions that you also see? 
Well, the good news is the whole what kind of sandwich question has become a lot less common in recent years than it used to be. There was a big fad for it maybe 10 years ago, maybe more. Um, it's becoming less common. But if you are asked something like that, the important thing is play along and show that you have creativity and that you have a sense of humor and that you're willing to think on your feet and handle unexpected things. Uh, so a good answer can, can do all those things. And if your answer isn't spot on and super related, um, that's fine, you know, but just use your imagination. There's no way to know what off the wall question they're likely to ask. So you can't really prepare for these ahead of time, but like what kind of sandwich would I be? Um, uh, I would want to be a sandwich that had a lot of different things in it so that it'd be really flexible and had something to offer to everyone. So, <laughs> so, you know, use your imagination. But then the other kind of questions, the puzzle questions or the case kind of questions, um, that's different. Those are very reasonable uh, sort of tests right there in the interview. And um, in puzzle questions and in cases, uh, one important thing is to think aloud because they may be more interested in your reasoning skills than in the specific answer you come up with. So you can start to say, well, one thing I'd want to consider is X and Y and Z. And I'd want to use this methodology to compare X and Y and Z. So by thinking through it, you show them that you know how to solve these questions. Um, and I actually have some more instructions about this kind of question in my book. Um, another thing to do is if you get stuck on a question like that, examine your assumptions because maybe what the question is really testing is, do you go into things with a fixed assumption or do you keep an open mind and, and really look at it freshly? Um, and uh, another thing is, if the answer seems remark ridiculously simple, then it, maybe it's a trick question, think it through some more. But on the other hand, if the answer seems to require some incredible higher math that you really can't be expected to know, then ask yourself, is this maybe easier than it looks? So again, mm -hmm. am I assuming something here? Um, but if, as far, and you mentioned um, coding questions in, in software engineering interviews. Well, yes, that's very, very typical. And there are sites that can specifically help you prepare for that. Um, Interview Cake comes to mind. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, yeah, you need to definitely study and prepare for those questions specifically. Mm -hmm. That's great. I mean, I'm glad to see these sandwich questions going away, honestly. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I will be honest, just a few months ago, maybe five months ago or so, I did see a set of these questions come across my desk that were from an interview. And one of the questions was, which salad dressing best emulates your life <laughs> philosophy? And <I'm, laughs> it was for a, a company that makes beer. It was for a, a microbrewery that ships around the country. And I just thought, really, this is, this is how you're going to decide. But I, uh, I had a client maybe a year or so ago that came in and he'd been asked a sandwich question and he got angry because he thought that was the most ridiculous thing. And it doesn't have anything to do with the work. And he was so mad. And of course he didn't get that job <laughs> No, because you got to like roll with it. Like you said, you've yeah. got to have a good attitude. You've got to use creativity and show that you, you know, you're there for the job and you're, you're willing right. to go through it. And anytime you, something happens in the interview that makes you think, well, maybe I don't want to work here. I would really advise you to set that, that thought aside until you get home afterwards mm -hmm. and then reconsider it. And you may change your mind about that or you may not. And that's your right as well. I agree. I like the idea of sort of bookmarking mm -hmm. what was said that made you think that. I really like the idea of writing it down because if something was said to you that's that's really um, inappropriate, which actually kind of leads into my next question, but if something was said that was inappropriate, I, w I want you to think about that and think right. about it. Even if you get the job offer, am I okay with how I was treated in the job interview? Because I expect that a candidate is treated with respect. And if they're not treated with respect, we need to take note of it as candidates. Yeah. And there's HR people are thinking a lot these days, or at least they seem to be based on their social media posts. Um, or a lot of them are, I will give that, about the candidate experience and making that a really good experience because it does reflect on the company. Um, 
So hopefully progress will more and more be made on that. I hope so. I think, you know, usually when you're interacting with HR, it is actually a great experience. Where I see the breakdown is often with the other folks in the organization who maybe haven't been trained on things like inappropriate questions. And I know, Mm -hmm. you know, in my case, I have been asked so many illegal questions. (laughs) um, There is a large company that I will not name, but we have all eaten there. (laughs) And um, their CIO interviewed me once and he said, well, I just want to know, are you married? Do you have children? Do you plan to have any children soon? (laughs) <laughs> and I've also been asked my age and and job interviews. And so it's really tricky when we we're asked these questions that we know are illegal and we know the person is going to be judging us in a way that's not really fair. It's hard to handle them. So when you come across illegal questions, like how do you recommend that we handle them? Um. So there are a couple of effective ways. Again, the ineffective way is call them out right then and there. That's not going to improve your rapport with them or anything. You're not going to probably get the job. But a couple of good ways to do it. Let's say they ask you, are you married? One thing you can do is address the underlying concern. So let's say the job is outside of your area and you'd have to relocate and they're asking, are you married? So you might answer, um... If you're concerned about the relocation to Seattle, I can assure you that it's um, something that I'm really interested in and committed to. I've been planning to move to Seattle for quite some time. I have friends in the area, and I've made some trips up there lately to look around. So you can say that without addressing it specifically, or if answering it directly and honestly won't hurt you at all, uh, you could say, yes, I am actually, I am married, and uh, my husband is really excited about moving up there because it's a great area for people in the tech field, and that's what he does. And we're also uh, both really into outdoors things, and he likes mountain climbing and uh, hiking, so it's going to be great for both of us. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So you just, yeah, you don't, you don't, you sidestep the fact that it's inappropriate, and and address what it is they're really trying to find out that that is relevant, or if they're asking about children. I'm sorry, and, and, or whether you're planning to have children soon. They're just wondering, are you going to quit the job when you, when you have children or something like that? So what you can say, uh, let's say you already have children, you can say, um, you know, if you're concerned about my ability to be here um, every time I need to be here and to give 110%, um, all you have to do is look at my record in my most recent job, and I'll be telling you more about that, and you'll see that there's nothing that's going to get in the way of my dedication to this job. Mm -hmm. I think those are great responses. I think also this is another opportunity to sort of bookmark what was said, Mm -hmm. because sometimes when someone's asking you things like that, I think it's telling you as much about them as they're trying to learn about you. Yeah. Uh, And that's, uh, if I could just briefly say a great thing to do right after an interview, whether anything inappropriate was asked or whether it was just a great interview is sit down someplace private and take a whole lot of notes on what was asked and how you answered and, and what they said during the chit chat before the interview and all kinds of things. And that'll really help you in your subsequent communications with them. Mm -hmm. So also along these lines, I'm curious, there's another question I've seen a lot of lately, especially now that the job market is, is more competitive and it, let me say on the employer side, (laughs) it's a better market for job seekers, but I have seen a number of cases where the hiring manager has said, well, kind of near the end of the interview, do you have any other interviews in progress, right? And the candidate might say, well, yes, I have a few. I'm actively interviewing, you know, something like like that. And then the hiring manager comes back and says, well, I'd like to know the details. Like, where are you interviewing? How much money are they going to give you, you know? What are the the benefits of that company? Like those kinds of things. And I mean, maybe maybe I'm being too sensitive, but I sort of think those details are sort of none of their business. And I'm not quite sure how to <laughs> how to say that or how to sidestep it in a way because I've seen it actually really upset the hiring manager when the candidate tries to sidestep this question. Hmm. Um. So I think one thing that you can do, since it is kind of hard to say. Um, those those are confidential matters that I don't want to reveal, is to put it on the other 
companies that made the offer and and realized that their offer to you was itself a confidential thing. And so out of being discreet towards those other employers, you don't wish to share those details. And when you put it that way, <clears throat> it makes it look a lot better, like you're coming from a place of discreetness and um, ethics. So you might just say something like, um, I have been having some other conversations and I, some of, there have been some offers and those are confidential to those companies. So I can't really share the details with you. Mm, I like it. I mean, in reality, as a job seeker, if we wanted to put that out there, we would do it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Or you can be even more vague about it and just say, um, yes, I've been having some conversations, but nothing is definite yet. Ooh, I like that a lot. I've been having some conversations. Okay, I'm going to mm-hmm. remember that. <laughs> and that's also a good answer if you mm-hmm. haven't exactly been having very many interviews. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Because this kind of smooths over that. Of course, if you're doing your job search in the right way, you have been having some conversations. Right, right. Well, as I mentioned in the introduction, you live in the San Francisco Bay Area. And mm-hmm. I cannot tell you how many people I talk to that really want to move to the San Francisco Bay Area (laughs) Um, who are in other states, but it can be tough when we're job seeking from somewhere else, like in the middle of the country. What can we do to get those job seek, those companies in California to take us seriously? Okay. So any candidate is always automatically taken more seriously if they are referred rather than just applying online and sending their resume. So first and foremost, I would say, take the advice you've heard about networking. And if you find that really icky or impossible, realize that you probably just don't quite know how to do it as well as you could yet. So read up on it or talk to people and figure out a good way to do it because uh, anybody who's getting referred in has more credibility right off the bat. You might wonder, how am I gonna network with people in another locality? I don't live there, I don't have experience there. Um, so I would say first start at home, uh, make up a list of companies and ask people in your own community who, you know, do you any, know anybody who, uh, works at any of these companies? And then also ask them, um, do you know anybody who lives in that area? And even if the person who lives in that area is, um, you know, not in your occupation, not in your target occupation at all, that's fine. Ask if you can talk to that person about what it's like living in that area. Mm-hmm. And, you know, what are the nicer neighborhoods to live in and, and what are the ups and downs of living there? And then after that conversation with that person, if you've built a nice rapport with them, you might be able to ask them, um, you know, these are some companies in the area I'm interested in. Do you happen to know anything about them or know anybody who is acquainted with them or who would better be able to give me an, an example to this, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, an answer? and. So that's a a good way to start. LinkedIn is also a good way to start. Uh, Just do a search on LinkedIn for people that you are connected to who are in that area. Mm -hmm. Um, And also go up there in advance wherever the area is and attend an industry event or professional association meetings. And that's a great way to meet some people there. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And then ask yourself, are there any organizations you belong to that might have a local branch in the other place, whether even if it's your church or it's um, some professional association or some club that you belong to? Mm-hmm. And, and they may be able to introduce you to people up there. And then um, a second area, aside from getting a referral to increase your credibility, is Um, employers are really concerned about hiring people from outside their area because they're concerned about what they call flight risk. Mm. That if they hire you and take you thousands of miles away from where you used to live, you might wind up not staying very long. And they know this because statistics have borne it out Mm. that there's much more chance somebody's going to quit within their first year if they came from someplace far away because they may be decide the area isn't what they had in mind after all, or they don't fit into the culture, or they're missing people back home who they're now far away from. Mm -hmm. So to mitigate that, some of the things I've been talking about in terms of going up there and going to events and not networking, those can help demonstrate the commitment that they want to see. You can talk about that. You can mention that in your cover letter. You know, I was just up there for the such and such event. It shows that you're really serious about it. Mm -hmm. Another way to demonstrate your commitment to the area is to mention any special ties you have to that area, like you used to live there, or you have family and friends there, 
or it's a mecca for professional or personal interests that you or your family have. Mm. Um, and a, a final tip is on your resume, instead of your own address, what you might put is relocating to San Francisco, California, 94104. So you're not lying about where you live. Some people will actually put the address of the city, you know, just baldly on their resume as if they live there. And you can try that, but you might wind up having some uncomfortable questions at the interview. Right. <laughs> but if you put relocating too, the resume still gets through the applicant tracking system, which is this database that sucks in your resume information and then HR searches through it by zip code, among other things, and by keywords to determine who they're actually going to bring in for an interview. And so that your resume will get through that zip code search. It'll then be seen by a human being who may still reject it because you don't actually live there. But if they love your other qualifications, they may just go, well, this person seems serious about relocating here and we'd like to meet them. I think you're right. I think you're right. That That's great recommendations. I like the idea of putting relocating too. Yeah. Uh, I think the one difficult question that can sometimes lead to that I've seen is occasionally the employer will say, oh, you're relocating. I guess that means you don't need us to help you with relocation. <laughs> and so, I, you know, it's being ready for that conversation. If you yeah. Relocation. And again, that's a question for negotiation, right? Mm -hmm. So you want to try and sidestep that in the early phases until they're making you a firm offer. Mm -hmm. And then you can see what you can get along those lines. Absolutely. But, mm -hmm. Yeah. And on the other hand, if you feel that you're kind of a long shot and you are willing to give up relocation expenses in order to be a stronger candidate, that's a choice you can make also is to say, uh, yes, I'd be willing to do that on my own. Mm -hmm. That it makes just, total sense. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this has been so helpful. Where can we go to learn more about you and your work? You mentioned a number of really great resources as we were talking. Yes, I mentioned I have an infographic on how to answer questions about salary expectations, and I also have a negotiation template. So uh, if you go to my website and blog, which is greatjobsooner.com, um, and then you will see um, you'll see a contact link in the upper right hand corner. You'll also see free consultation, a big red button. If you click either of those, it takes you to the same place, which is a form where you can send me an email and say, hey, Thea, I would like to get a copy of your infographic on salary, your salary infographic, and I'll be happy to shoot that off to you. Um, and then if you would like to get the negotiation template, you can just simply subscribe. So there's a button there that says subscribe for a free gift. And what you'd be subscribing to is my job search tips blog, where once a week I publish a really informative article about resumes. I'm also a resume writer or about job search strategy. And I do coaching on that or about interviewing. And, and you, of course, you can unsubscribe anytime you like. So greatjobsooner.com. I'd love to hear from you. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Thea. This has been great. Likewise, it's been a great conversation and I hope to come back and talk to you again sometime. Yes, and thank you for listening. If you've enjoyed the episode today, please don't forget to help me out. Go to Apple Podcasts and subscribe to the show. The more subscribers we have, the easier it is for people to find the show. Thank you for listening to the Copeland Coaching Podcast today with your host, Angela Copeland. Tune in next time to get more great tips on turning your job search into a slam dunk.